Yeah, so the theme of my introduction was going to be that not only does Tom not really need an introduction, in some sense, it's it's a little ridiculous to introduce him. It's like saying welcome home to your spouse when they come home from a day of work, which nobody's coming home from because everyone's working at home anyway these days. Um, you know, most of you know him already. Many of you know him at least as well as I do. He taught here at UConn for 10 years and was the director of the insurance. 11 Center. years. 11 years. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, he's now, though, William Paul Nisi professor at, at Penn. Uh, he has written five books and something like 50 articles and book chapters, and he brings to all of those projects the kind of the great lawyers focus and attention on detail and, and mastery of the complex, uh, you know, workings of, the, of these transactions, but also um, a kind of social scientists uh, engagement with theory, whether it's from, uh, you know, from Foucault to behavioral economics and all that the world's his oyster as far as that goes. And each time he does it, he reveals something really important and illuminating. And today's topic, I'm sure, will be exactly the same. So uh, great to have Tom here talking about long term care insurance, which, as he said before, is fantastically complicated and rich and interesting and not much known about. So, Tom, now you can go. Great. All right. Well, so this is a most of my research projects that are that are of this sort where I kind of go out in the world and figure something out and then come back and talk about it go through a couple different phases and one of which the first phase is the should I do this phase and then the second phase is what I call the discovery phase where I'm figuring out you know how the world works and then the third phase which I'm not yet in here is okay now that I figured this out what does this mean for legal scholarship Insurance, our understanding of insurance markets, et cetera. So that I'm, I'm not yet there with this, although I'm, you know, really confident that that something will come out of it because it's a very rich story. Uh, and the, you know, the title of the long-term care insurance debacle is, uh, you know, a work in progress. The, the, the things that, that I gave to this uh, class to read are two memos written by Camila Bailey, who's a, uh, actually a JD student at Penn, who had been a financial analyst before and is obviously not deterred by incredibly complicated stuff. Uh, and so uh, let me see if I can. OK, so what am I going to do? So I'm going to talk about how I got to this and how it fits into the what I call insurance law and society scholarship, which is what I see my work generally is fitting into. Uh, we'll talk about what is long term care insurance. I'll teach you about key assumptions in the long term care insurance pricing models, uh, what the people doing those got wrong back when this stuff was actually sold. Um, explain, you know, this will be a little bit of review of what we already did, but I think it's helpful that, you know, what is it that makes long term care insurance so much more risky than life insurance? Mm -hmm. um, and then extrapolating from the GE and SHIP examples that were in those memos, I, I come up with what I think of this, that, and this is, you know, this is, uh, Camilla has definitely contributed to this too, what, what we think of as the five stages of the LTC insurance debacle. Uh, and then the questions about lessons learned is something that I just, I'm hoping to get some in, input on. So, so I wrote it, so my most recent, um, what I think of as significant article is this uh, piece called Uncertainty is Greater Than Risk Lessons for Legal Thought in the Insurance Runoff Market, where I went off and investigated uh, the current you know, thriving market in the sale of closed books of insurance uh, by uh, life insurance and then also and 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 also so life insurance and annuities on the one hand and then on the other hand um, uh, liability insurance and, and some property in, insurance um, and the you know the I the basic story there was that I brought back was the hey this is you know um, the insurance industry in in theory is thought a lot about many people think about insurance as being about risk, which is sort of probabilistic, knowable and advanced things. And and the sociological research, you know, most prominently done that by uh, Richard Erickson and collaborators has taught us that what people in the insurance business know uh, is that insurance is about uncertainty, which is sort of non-probabilistic problems, <laughs> not, not so much risk. And so, you know, th this, what I explained in this article was how the insurance runoff market uh, is one of the ways that insurance uh, deals with uncertainty. And one of the things that I discovered in that research was that in contrast to life insurance, annuities, liability insurance, property insurance, there is not a very robust runoff market with long-term care insurance since, you know, there is a growing one, but it's much less robust. And then also 
in, in contrast to the life in PNC world that the, the entire long-term care market market like got more got in trouble didn't work whereas in life in PNC it's you know the problems are more contained the runoff you know after runoff the companies who who sell the or you know who reinsurance and the runoff arrangements continue operating um, you know question it is there an LTC market that can be saved and then you know sort of more uh, globally, you know, what does this case study teach us about how the insurance market contains and distributes uncertainty? And, you know, that the, my conclusions of uncertainty, you know, is greater than risk, were fairly optimistic that, you know, we can, the insurance industry can deal with these, you know, hairy things that come along every so often. Um, and, you know, and so we should understand runoff as being part of the kind of organic, natural life of insurance is that you know some things don't work out we do we do a runoff that's how we keep it going um all right so what is long-term care insurance so so long-term care insurance as it was sold uh until the er, the mid 2000s uh is it's insurance against the costs associated with disability the idea was towards the end of life and so there was a basic cover uh that would just cover nursing home costs but then there came to be enhancements you could cover for you know, assisted living facility for community care, meaning sort of thing that is sort of like, you know, senior facility you go to for the day, but then you come home and then in-home care. And the idea of long-term care insurance is it's, you know, like a retirement product is you would buy it when you were, you know, 40. I mean, maybe, I, I mean some people bought it younger, but you buy it when you're 40, 50, 60, with the idea that you wouldn't need it for 20 or 30 or 40 or even 50 years later. Um, so it's a really long-term product. And, and, and there were a variety of things that would affect your premium. One was, did you buy one of these enhancements? You know, it seems sort of obvious, more coverage, more cost. Two, uh, age, your age when you started buying it and your health status. Again, sort of typical risk-based pricing uh, and never really any push with, as with health insurance to have this be something where where there was a, it was a redistributive you know redistributional in a kind of like tax progressive idea of redistribution. I mean, all insurance redistributes from the unlucky to the lucky from the lucky to the unlucky, but but there wasn't a. And then the so so those are you think about you know more coverage or um, you if you're older or less healthy when you would buy it you would be seen as more likely to need it so you would pay a higher premium or maybe they wouldn't sell it to you at all. Uh, there's something called the elimination period, which is like sort of traditional disability insurance, which is, you know, how long do you have to wait? How long do you have to be eligible before you can start getting the payments? There was a daily benefit amount. In other words, it wasn't the idea, you know, it's not like an HMO where they, pro or even, um, you know, our sort of idea of health insurance where, you know, they, it just pays for the care. No, it pays us up to a certain amount for the kind of things that you're allowed to buy with it. Um, and that amount could be specific, like X amount for nursing home, up to X amount for in-home care, up to X amount for community care, or it could be flexible, which is more popular. And there was just be, you could get 400, 500, whatever the amount of is, dollars per day that you could spend if you were eligible on, you know, any of these things. Uh, there was a difference in whether the benefit period, like how long were you allowed to collect? It could be capped. In other words, you would get the benefit for no more than three years, or you get the benefit for no more than six years, or it could be uncapped, which is known as lifetime benefit. Um, and there was, there could be inflation riders, because again, because they're not paying for the service, but they're giving you money to buy the service, there's the risk of inflation. So you could buy the inflation rider, and then it could either be sold on a group basis, you know, through employment or individual. And finally, it could be either a single or a joint life, uh, you know, back when this was being sold, marriage was something that was between a man and a woman. Uh, now, if it were in the market, I'm sure it would be, you know, whoever's married can buy a joint. Um, and as my little slide says, so what was the very best product? The very best product was a joint life, zero day waiting period, lifetime benefit, flexible pool of money, and inflation protected. Uh, and if you start to kind of think about that, and think about the fact that it's being priced today for something that might not be finished being paid for for 50 years, you can already see what's tricky about it. All right, what were some key assumptions that had to be made when you were pricing long-term care insurance? Well, 
but the most important was this was the discount rate, which is a way of thinking about, you know, assets that you have today that you're going to hold into the future and liabilities that aren't going to arise until the future. And that's really important. So a higher discount rate means that your assets will be assumed to earn greater returns. And it also means that how you think about your future liabilities is more heavily discounted. So the higher the discount rate, the lower the premium you could charge is the way of thinking about it. Um, and uh, when when I was um, let's see, when, when I was I I I I taught uh, the basic insurance class in Wharton at one point, and I gave a, my exam consisted of uh, cartoons uh, that you had to that students tell me what it meant. Uh, and one of my favorite cartoons was a Dilbert cartoon in which there's a guy standing there, and there's like this little whiff of smoke coming out of his nose. And the caption says, oh, that's what happened when he assumed a 15% discount rate in the in the pension program, uh, which his soul was leaving his body. Uh, and so, you know, high discount rate is uh, problematic, but you know, but, so, but you have to think about it, you have to have a dis discount, right? Then you have to, another assumption is a lapse rate. So lapse is what happens when, when you uh, don't renew your policy. A, a long-term care insurance policy was a guaranteed renewable fixed rate, a fixed premium policy that you pay in for a long time and then collect later. So if someone lapses, it's amazing for the insurance company because it means that they've paid in a certain number of years and then you know they've lapsed, they aren't paying their premiums so they no longer have a liability. So the entire reserve that, um, uh, Someone's asking me to annotate, I'm going to decline. Um, I, I, so, so a lapse rate is just, you know, the minute someone lapses, the reserve that the company has set for the policy, you know, goes directly to the uh, asset side of the balance sheet. So, so a higher, higher lapse rate, so higher discount rate means you can charge less, higher lapse rate means you can charge less. So utilization, you know, who's going to get disabled and take the benefit and for how long? Uh, you know, a higher utilization means higher liabilities, you know, lower utilization means lower liabilities. Um, and you can think about sort of three pieces of that. There's the morbidity, which is the idea of, you know, when you're going to, who's going to get disabled and, and, and uh, when. There's mortality, you know, mortality, you know, long-term care insurance is like an annuity in the sense that death is good for the insurance company. So, um, you know, you have to think about that. And then and then there's technology, which is a term that I mean in this context to be really broadly understood. In other words, uh, technology is, you know, what can be done for someone that's disabled so that they would, uh, you know, want to go to a community care or in-care home. Uh, how willing were people to go to utilize these services? How, uh, how long? Um, and you know that that sort of thing. You can think about it as thing. You know, think about it as a category of things that affect utilization that aren't either morbidity or mortality. And then you know, I make the point here that a policy bought at age forty-five could be a liability. You know, fifty plus years uh, later. So, 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 what did they get wrong? The answer is almost everything. They assumed a discount rate that was much too high. I mean, who thought in 1990 that we'd have zero, essentially a 0% interest rates? Like nobody thought that, right? It's just like, I mean, I mean, my, the, the, my first uh, house, which I bought in 1988 was, uh, I bought it with a variable mortgage and the teaser rate was 10% and it would go up 2% each of the following years. And you know, I'll never forget. There was one year where like, thank God I got a bonus at work. Otherwise we wouldn't have been able to pay the mortgage. Uh, so, you know, who would have thought that it would be, you know, that we do it. And then the assumed lapse rate was much too high. And I, what, you know, I'm still trying to, you know, narrow, nail this down, but what I'm told is they looked at medical Medicare supplemental policies as their, you know, the question of like, well, what, you know, cause you know, to figure out when you're just pricing this new policy, a new thing, like, what are people going to lapse and they said, oh, we'll look at when do people drop Medicare supplemental policies and we'll assume that rate. And that turned out to be way too high. And, you know, and the reason is, is people pay in for 20, 30 years. Like 
you know, I'm not gonna lapse. Like I've, I've paid all this money now, and I have to pay a little bit more. And that's so 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 people don't haven't lapsed. And then the assumed utilization was 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 much too low. And and, and there were a bunch of assumptions. Um, one is that the, the assumption about technology was that medical advances would lead to reduced or deferred old age disability. So what really happened was that you know technology you know developed in a way that gave more and more expensive ways to help people deal with disability. So there was more sort of utilization in that regard. And then you know moving to assisted living, but you know from 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 sort of terrible nursing homes that no one wants to live in, we've moved to you know assisted living facilities, and then. You know, a lot of people now, you know, anything happens, you would get a short term stay in rehabilitation. And, you know, since you have a zero waiting period, a short term stay in rehabilitation, as in, you know, I have a zero waiting period in lifetime benefit. Hey, I'm definitely going to collect when I go to rehab center. And I think I'm more likely to go to rehab center uh, because it's not going to cost me as much. Uh, and then, you know, and moving to nursing homes all became increasingly common. I, you know, my, in, 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 in my family, we have a joke about anyone who, uh, in my community that moves to uh, South Florida, they're either in nursing home uh, business or in the real estate business. And, uh, you know, at, nursing home business has been a great business. It's been terrible for long-term care companies, but it's been great for the nursing home companies. So, so they got that wrong. Uh, okay, what makes, so, so, so why is it that these companies who were very good at dealing with life insurance why did what makes it life term long term care insurance so much more riskier than life insurance? So what do they have in common? They're both long term guaranteed renewable fixed premium contracts. Both expose insurers to significant risk on both the asset side of the balance sheet and the liability side of the balance sheet. And the reason and and, and the asset side risk is more significant for life insurance than for liability or property insurance because the time you know leave asbestos and environmental aside. The time between when someone pays the premium when they get the benefit is very long. So asset management is a big part of the business. But okay, what's different? One is long-term care liabilities are much more uncertain. That you know, the, the liability of a life insurance company is entirely about uh, mortality. Uh, when, you know, whether you're signing an annuity or a, or a life insurance contract, it's all about how long people are gonna live. And that doesn't change uh, much over time and you know changes super slowly the other thing that's different is that the life insurance business increasingly has managed to shift the asset side risk to policyholders if, you know the hottest thing in life insurance from the early 2000s was variable products variable annuities and that those products um the benefit is based on a formula that is based on the size of the asset, you know, the the uh, the parameter upon which the asset is based. And so, you know, the, they don't have asset, you know, for that product, there's not asset side, side risk. And there's never been such a thing as variable long-term care insurance. And the, you might say the whole idea, you know, of the of what people want when they're getting long-term insurance is not like some variable benefit that depends on what happens to some reference book of securities. Um, so what does that mean? So the long-term care insurance faced an even more intractable version of the problem on the asset side of the balance sheet that led to life insurance runoff, namely declining interest rates. And there's been a lot of life insurance runoff, uh, and you know, and it, mostly of like annuity type or pension type products. Um, and on top of that, they had big problems on the liability side. So it's just just a much more difficult problem. Um, all right. So that's the sort of setup of a little bit. And, and, and actually, let me just pause there and ask if anyone has any questions about the kind of mechanics of long-term care insurance. Tom, I, it's not exactly a mechanics question, but I mean, when you were running through all the assumptions that they made, you know, yes, people were not thinking that interest rates could be 1% or half a percent and people, lapse rates were whatever, but, I mean, surely the whole point is that you don't just use assumptions, you use a range of assumptions so that you say, well, what's the worst case scenario if all these things really came up? How much, you know, there's these value at risk models and all that kind of other stuff. They just weren't thinking like, oh, we have to really look at a range of, of, of assumptions. P and what P if Peter, all these things you know, happen at hey, once? Hey, P Peter, this is yeah. Walter, Peter, this is Walter Welsh. Can I jump in for one second on this? 
Absolutely. Okay. So in a company that I worked for, say 35 years ago, they started with long-term care. And one of the things that you can, these late things that Tom just laid out are a very good way to think about the risks today. Uh, I talked to the, I can remember talking to the actuary because it's a new, brand new product for the company. I mean, the company has many lines of business and sometimes it takes more risk in a new line. He said, how do you um, figure out what the uh, reserve will be? And the actuary says to me, well, we just reserve the entire premium less $1. And, and then I said, well, how did you get the premium? I said, well, we look at what they're charging in the market, which is not the way to determine your pricing model. But in a new business, they might often be driven by just what's going on in the market. And we'll just sort of try this. I mean, all these things that uh, Tom lays on in slides are all the things you have to use, but there was sort of just that companies that already had other lines of business would just experiment getting into long-term care. Of course, if they had other lines of business, they could protect themselves in that regard or just get out of the long-term care business, which many companies did. So, you, yeah, you, and I don't think the Hartford got in trouble in long-term care, right, Walter? I don't think, I mean, I mean, I'm sure you didn't make any money at it, but I don't think they're not, it's not. No, we, 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 we just got out of it. We get, well, actually, in my <laughs> career, we got in and out of it twice. <laughs> We're in and then, and then back out. And because you, you saw these things, but it, when you initially start in the business, you're, I, you're, and what the question Peter's asking is they should be taking all these things into account. Some of it is a little bit of a bet, just like on a new line of business. You know, we'll, we'll take a shot. We'll see what the market's going on in the market. And we'll do some of this analysis. And then they got out and, you know, the companies that got in big trouble were, whereas long-term care was their only line of business. Uh, and of course that's, that's a problem, but you're right. I mean, with the way you laid this out, Tom, that's perfect. And uh, Peter, you might be right. They should be looking at other things. I think sometimes they were just saying, let's experiment with this, this line of business. Let's see what happens. And, uh, Peter, I also have a very quick question um, for Tom. The, I think I failed to appreciate really until you described it here. I've always thought of long-term care insurance as sort of being a casualty coverage, you know, dollars in dollars out. And you're making me realize here that that is not the model at all. It is sort of a cash value, build it up for future a la life insurance kind of coverage. And maybe it's just a recognition on my part, but I think a lot follows from that different, different model. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, you know, I had a conversation today with a guy who had used to be at uh, Mercer and, and he told me, and, and we're, I mean, we're verifying this. He told me that some policies were actually sold where they had a cash value that you could liquidate if you hadn't collected for a certain number of years. And I, and I so really even more overt, that. even more overt. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I have a hunch, I, you know, since these things were so underpriced, my, my expectation is that people, smart people didn't exercise that cash value because the cash value, you know, the cash value was you got your premiums back plus a little bit. Whereas, you know, what, what what you really should have done from an actuarial point of that perspective is double the amount you'd already paid. Yeah. And actually, <laughs> I think that's what some yeah. companies are now offering as a way to liquidate the coverage and get people to opt out. Absolutely. You know, and that's sort of like today's version of it. That's like the long-term care version of a commutation, right? That you, that you are, you know, basically buying back the policy. Uh, yeah. All right. So we talked about what they Tom, oh. on, what may I don't, and we can talk later about this a lot, but I mean, there's a one way, I, mean, I don't know what percentage of long-term care policies have variable rates. Uh, they don't necessarily have fixed premiums, right? They can go up uh, or I guess theoretically down based on certain you know, number of years and various uh, indications. Is that, I think that's correct, but that would tell Well, I don't, my, I mean, premium. my understanding is that they were, is that they were fixed premium. There'd be a different premium based on how old you were or what your health status was when you signed up. But I mean, there's no reason they couldn't have been set to have a, a um, sort of an increasing premium that if you thought about it, you thought you'd be making more money to get older. Um, I, you know, listen, I, I, it wouldn't shock me if things, if some had been sold, sold that, that that way, but either way, the formula would have been fixed at the time you bought it. Um, unless, and this we'll get into it, unless the insurance commissioner authorizes an a uh, overall premium increase, which is something that 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 happened. Um, all right, so these are my five stages of the, of the long term care uh, debacle. I, the, the first phase is enthusiasm. 
The second phase is discovery. Oh. The third is management. I, I, this, this, I don't like this title. I didn't want to say uh, hiding because that would be a little too unfair, but the, it would sort of be non-transparent ways of you know, trying to work it out. The next, the fourth phase is acceptance. You know what, this is a disaster. You have to deal with it. And then the final phase is the, is, is, is the workout. And uh, so, so enthusiasm is from invention to the late 1990s. And again, and this, these are, you know, you know, this, this, as you saw, Camilla laid out four of these phases and I just put the labels on them. Um, you know, what, what happened? There was, you know, to the extent, I, I mean, I'm sure that Walter is right that the way that it was in fact priced was by looking at the market, but you had to explain why you were pricing. And so in order to do that, there was the sort of fitting of the assumptions to meet the price that you needed. Um, and, you know, you could have, there were a lot, there were, I mean, one of the things about long-term care insurance is there are so many assumptions that it is not at all difficult for the actuary to, you know, alter the assumptions to get the price you want, um, and uh, and so the projections and and uh, two companies, Conseco and GE, competed to be the market leaders. So that when you know the Hartford decided it wanted to get out of long-term care insurance, there was two ready, willing, and able buyers. Um, so Amex, Travelers, apparently the Hartford. I really, you know, I, I, I'm going to make a list of all the companies who are just, if they thought about it, should be blessing the CEO who decided to sell the long-term care insurance to the suck, to what turned out to be the suckers, Conseco and GE. Um, you know, and the question that I, this is, again, we're still in the discovery phase. I would just love to know, like when they, when they sold their businesses to Conseco and GE in the late 1990s, did they, did they do this because they saw the problems or was it simply that, you know, they didn't have the scale and so they thought they really could beat Conseco and GE. So it was just, you know, they thought that they had lost, you know, <laughs> in retrospect, they won. Uh, and so so that's the enthusiasm period. And, and this is during the enthusiasm period is when the enhancements get added, when all that, when you can get the zero, um, you know, zero day <clears throat> elimination period, inflation protected joint survivor, you know, flexible benefit policy that is the absolute uh, nightmare for Conseco uh, and GE. Uh, all right, so then the next phase is discovery. And this is the early aughts. And Camilla has done a really great job of finding articles from this era that indicated people were raising problems with, they were questioning whether the, uh, the really could happen. And though, you know, Conseco got into trouble, not only you know, at this point, they, they just coincidentally, they, you know, they bought Green Tree, which was turned out to be a bad purchase from a finance, you know, they, they were in the sort of consumer finance business and, and, and that, sl that slowed down Conseco somewhat, but, but GE also slowed down and some books got put in the runoff. And again, just for people that don't know that terms, the idea of runoff is that, that, that when you have a group of policies that you've already sold, but you still have obligations under, and, and you don't want to sell them anymore, but you still have obligations under those policies. You you do what's called putting them into runoff, that you put them in a unit that's charged with managing them, but you're not selling new policies. And Conseco stopped selling new policies. G, GE sold ERC, which sold a lot of reinsurance of, of um, long-term care insurance, and it spun up Gen, Genworth, which is a subsidiary that was heavily into um, long-term care insurance and not particularly noticed by the analyst community at the time was GE did spin off Gen Genworth, but the regulators here, this is, this is an example of sort of insurance regulator working, sort of insisted that, that, that GE give a pretty hefty financial guarantee to Genworth, which is why Genworth, that, and that, that liability is still very much on GE's, uh, GE's book. Um, so, this time, so this is, you know, people, so this is, but this is, two, you know, this is 17 years ago, uh, you know, long-term insurance, insurance market, as we know, it basically stopped, but lots of liabilities out there. All right. So then from then to 2017, and this is a flexible time period. This is what we're calling management, uh, which is, you know, Conseco got rid of its long-term care insurance 
we renamed it something called SHIP, which I forget what it stands for, but it's the P is Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania, by the way, becomes sort of ground zero for a lot of the uh, regulatory work dealing with companies in trouble. Um, and then GE and the other companies, they, they manage their enforced books on a below the radar screen basis. You could look at their financial reports and you could not figure out uh, what was going on. Um, and, you know, so what, what, what were they doing during this period? They were gradually adjusting their reserves um, in a way that didn't upset the GE's dividends, for example. They were seeking and obtaining premium increases. So, so premium increases have been granted really across the country, different amounts in different jurisdictions, based on a showing that the entire um, line of business was going to be posing a solvency problem for the company if they didn't raise premiums. And so, it, you know, these policies were guaranteed premium, but the guaranteed premium was subject to the ability to raise the, the, the premiums for the class with approval of the regulators. Uh, there's been some litigation about that, but that on the whole has been unsuccessful in, um, you know, on rolling back those regulators. You know, there's a, I'm sure Walter can, Walter can explain this part much better than I do, but the, you know, the, the, the blessing of the insurance regulator insulates the company from a lot of challenges to uh, premium increases. Uh, and then the other thing they were doing, what, you know, this is a sort of a version of what um, Robert Yes was saying, is that, is that when there was a premium increase, uh, there would be an opportunity for someone to buy down their coverage so that they didn't have a premium increase or the premium increase was left. And those opportunities, uh, I put in quotes, uh, were structured in a way that were designed to get people to give up the thing that posted the biggest liability to the insurance company. And so, for example, there would be a lifetime benefit. That would be a big liability to the insurance company. The biggest thing they try to do is to get people to switch from lifetime benefit to a six-year or three-year benefit. Because the minute someone switches from a lifetime to a six or three-year benefit, um, that reduces the amount the insurance company has to reserve for that policy tremendously, and that you know that reserve adjustment goes directly to the bottom line. Um, and I sort of say here, this is you know during this period, transparency would 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 not be a word that one would use in relation to uh, long term care uh, insurance. All right, so then the next stage is is acceptance, and uh, you know we I might be crediting GE's Markopoulos scandal too much, but. But but not for GE. So so Harry Markopoulos, who's the guy who's famously discovered the Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme, although no one paid attention to him at the time, put out this report where he candidly said that he'd been paid by a short seller to do a report exposing uh, GE's huge one for care insurance problem. And it turned out that much of his report was wrong, either on purpose or not. Uh, but in order to prove that he was wrong, GE had to become much more transparent about what was going on with its um, <clears throat> long-term care reserves and that kind of thing. And they, there's actually, a, a, they, they did a, a teach-in that is sort of famous to people in the business that is actually, if anyone really wants to um, understand this stuff, you know, Google GE uh, long-term care insurance teach-in and you'll find a you know, really pretty good ex ex explanation, I would say. Camilla told me she learned more about uh, the, that by reading that teaching than that. Um, and so, uh, so and, and GE hired a you know this, you know they hired a new person to this and this 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 coincided with the change in C CEOs at GE. And so, you know, what does a new CEO want to do? Explain why all the problems are due to the former, former CEO. And so, fix it. You know, so 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 uh, GE. And so. Um, now, GEO's problems are not gone away. They've just done a better job of explaining them. A uh, couple things that, that are worth knowing about is that Genworth, which is, again, a separate company, but very much hooked to GE's um, balance sheet by virtue of this guarantee. Uh, Genworth had a dance with a Chinese company called Oceanwide that uh, no one could understand why from an insurance perspective Oceanwide would be trying to buy this bucket of trash policies. But 
Other people thought, hey, that's a really a political move. And, you know, after the election, the, the deal uh, collapsed. And so that led some, uh, gave me some thought that maybe that political part was 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 true, or maybe they just didn't understand what was going on and eventually figured out that it was a really bad idea. Um, there's talk about whether there's going to be a rehabilitation of, uh, of, of, of Genworth and, you know, what's that going to mean for GE? Uh, SHIP, which is what, you know, Conseco became SHIP, SHIP did go into rehabilitation. Um, and there's a, um, you know, a, re a, a, a plan uh, that is laid out and explained in, in, in Camilla's paper. Um, one other example of the sort of acceptance was, was Banker's Life, <clears throat> which was another market leader um, and had been doing a running off the uh, its long-term term insurance, you know, during, for the same period. It did a huge deal in 2018 with Wilton Reed, um, that which Wil Wilton Reed gave uh, 3.25 billion, or G <clears throat> GE, sorry, Banker's Life paid Wilton Reed 3.25 Billion. Um, most of that was just was the assets that were held in reserves, but there was a you know a payment of about eight hundred twenty five million dollars by the parent on top of the earlier capital transfusions. And you know this is an example of, of <clears throat> acceptance that I have this terrible problem. I want to get rid of it. It's going to cost me a fortune, but I'm doing it. And so that's that's acceptance. And then workout. You know what's going to be the workout phase? So you know what's going to happen? GE. You know, I think there'll be, you know, continued hard knuckle negotiation with regulators over premium increases, even more opaque and pressured opportunities for policyholders to buy down the benefits to avoid premium increases. Um, and then, you know, I also think there's going to be, they're going to be taking more risk on the asset side of the balance sheet because I met my colleague Natasha Saren did a really great paper where she looked at what happened on the asset side of the balance sheet when Apollo. Um, uh, which is a you know, private equity company that people <clears throat> know about um, buys buys life companies and and, and that happens and, and the, the, this part of the um, you know except for the first part the negotiation with regulators over premium increases this the set, set the uh, these opaque and pressured opportunities to buy down the benefits and the more risk on the assets out of the balance sheet are are really mirrors of what happens in the traditional uh, runoff insurance market where um, uh, companies, you know, basically, insurance companies try to buy back the policies, and uh, by giving a fixed amount so that they can cut off their liabilities. And then, uh, you know, these one-off companies don't. It's not as important to them to have a high credit rating because they're not selling anything that's new. You know, um, you know GE needs a good credit rating. Uh, a runoff insurance company, you know, it needs a credit rating so that it, you know, is it. So it's not insolvent, so it satisfies you know the regulators, but it doesn't need a good credit rating. And so you know what does it do? It can, it it you know if it ends up the as much as it can, and then it uh, takes risk on the asset side of the balance sheet. And in order to you know keep end the pain, it looks for opportunities to commute or to buy out the benefit from the from the policyholders. Um, and you know so that's that's the you know, the results of my discovery phase of the, of the research, you, you know, I still, what I'd say, I don't, I'm not, I don't know yet what, what this, what, what this means for, you know, insurance and society scholarship, other than this is, you know, going to be a case study of, of a product that didn't work and what's the life cycle of a product that didn't work and, uh, you know, what happens to the companies that sort of go too much into it. Um, and uh, so anyway, so I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions or appreciations if it's interested to know what people will think about Great. all this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Schwartz is the first one in the queue. And I think, Tom, if you can see the participants, why don't you just manage the queue unless you don't want to after this, but I, I promise. All right, let me, I've got, excuse me while I move this thing to see how to stop sharing. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I can unshare for you. Uh, let's see. Oh, can you unshare for me? That'd be great. No, I don't know if I can. I'd rather not. Stop sharing. Uh, I think I saw the stop sharing button. Yeah, you did. Great. Perfect. That'd okay, great. so Dan Schwartz, right. and then everybody else just raise your hand and Tom will call on you. Hi, Tom. And I'll okay. say it's, it's hey, a Dan. pleasure. The, the cyber world is a pleasure. This is my second talk of yours from the day. So I'm getting a lot more Tom Baker. I know, that's great. <laughs> yeah. It's great. No, absolutely. The second, a second really interesting talk of the day. Um, 
My question is, there are two related questions, I guess. Um, I was surprised by the lack of regulators in your story, yeah. um, and in particular early on. And I guess particularly I was surprised by also, I guess, your la your willingness to accept insurers' explanations as opposed to more nefarious explanations. And I just wonder whether there were some people at the top of these companies who knew that they were taking on a tremendous amount of risk and knew that they could get away with it because there wasn't a, a, a record of how this product would perform and that, you know, if this is going to explode, it was going to explode after they retired exactly. 20 years down the road. Yep. And yeah, no, listen, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I just don't want to put that in print and say it like a thing because I don't know yet. But you know, it's how is there a way you know, of figuring G, it out? Or G, like, I mean, were, were regulators asking that question? Or like I don't, you know, and, and here, you know, in Hartford is I mean Walter's win, winching, is wincing, <laughs> but, but but I think but think about GE. Like GE was known for having a steady dividend, a reliable, predictable dividend. When you're collecting premiums on something that isn't going to be paid out for 20 or 30 years, like you could definitely use that to manage your dividends. I don't have a basis for saying that they did, yeah. but the temptation would certainly be there. You can see that if you take a company that is an insurance company and not a conglomerate, although Hartford was once part of one, the way the company, I think they could look at, at, at long-term care, not that they were as dance that they were going to just retire that they they took they could take a risk on a new product in the life side or bob could say in the property casualty side recognizing that they had lots of other businesses that they'd well priced and threw off surplus and they would learn as they went this was clearly learning as they went along what is the market like what's happening to our claims experience and if we got it wrong we'll adjust the product or we'll get out of the business but not that we're gonna retire and leave the Leave the policyholders without benefits. That that isn't really how the companies were run. It maybe it may make make a nice story, but I I think that they again this was you put your toe in the water, and you might find though that some companies got into this in a big way and thought that they would just get the money and then leave the policyholders. And the regulators were learning about this product. This isn't the first time the regulators had to learn about how products work as they as they go along, and they clearly were learning. Yeah, but what I would say, Dan, the reason there's an absence of that is that we just haven't gone down that. We're not. We haven't figured that part out yet. But but it is part of the project. I mean, for 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 better or worse, I'm prepared to go pretty far down the rabbit hole with this project, and uh, I've got ten years, so I can take my time. Bob, um, so I'm going to flip the, the label of the, uh, the the school from insurance and society to society and insurance. And is sort of the corollary to this issue is the vast number of people in the United States who have no long term care insurance at all. And there's no social safety net program in place to cover that unmet need. And yet there are people who are talking about a legislative solution, maybe with a payroll tax or something that would fund with an extended elimination period and, and a limited benefit, some sort of long term care safety net program for individuals leaving the possibility of a wraparound for the private sector to cover an elimination period, to cover an excess benefit. Um, and I'm wondering whether uh, the interest that might be shown in that sort of legislation by some of these companies might be a way out for them that they, they see potentially down the road if everything falls into place regarding a new social safety net program, a way to expand the market bring in more premium dollars and sell this wraparound as a way of coming out the other end of this dilemma they find themselves in. So I don't know if you've come across that at all in your exploration. No, but I would like to, I, I'll email you after it because I'd, I'd like to know that because as you know, in struggling, you know, like, it's, you know, maybe this is too much information, but, you know, I start doing these projects because I'm intensely curious about something and figure that I'll find something that's worth, that'll be, you know, interesting to our views and to society. And, you know, one thing this is a demonstration of is that I don't think the private long-term care market uh, it certainly hasn't worked yet. You know, and I was telling my, I'm telling my wife about this product. She's like, who would think that 
private companies could handle that. This seems like something for the government. And, you know, it would be interesting to think, I mean, maybe the, the, the fact that it's so concentrated now, the, the, the liability is like it's GE, it's SHIP, it's Walton Reed, it's a few companies, I, but you know, their golden, you know, their dream would be a new public program with a coordination of benefit provision that makes them excess, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you know, yeah. And might, might we float them? Yeah, and might we float them? Absolutely. I, I have a hunch there's not going to be much interest in making them and letting them off the hook for their past promises that were overly optimistic. No, but, but, but know, a new I product and an infusion of premium might yeah. be you know, a yep. solution. And we'll, we'll talk. Definitely. Who else? Other thoughts, questions? We have some regulators in the class who might have thoughts or might not. I'm not trying to call on anybody cold, cold or otherwise, but if you want to step forward. Nope. You know, one one thing that uh, since no one's asking a question, I'll, I'll just speculate about something. You know, you know, as I kind of think about the problem right now, you've got these these declining large but declining pools of people who are aging. And you know, and you sort of think about okay who's the winners and who's the losers in a certain sense the winners are the people who you know collect right but of course no they're not because you're in a nursing home wouldn't you rather not be in a nursing home and so the and who are the losers the losers are the people that pay in and don't collect and why because they're not in a nursing home and that in a certain way they're i mean the the Nobody paid the right amount. Everybody paid too little in the pool. So if what happens is that the people who stay in for a long time, you know, don't get the benefit that they were promised or all the benefits that they were promised, I you know, yes, in a certain sense, that's terrible. But on the other hand, you know, they lived longer outside of the nursing home. It's like I pay my life insurance premium. I don't die this year. I'm not complaining about it. And, I, and again, it's, it, 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 I mean, it's terrible that they're not getting what they promised. But given we're in a circumstance where people are not going to be able to get what they're promised, I, I, I have some sympathy for regulators and heads of companies that are kind of trying to stretch this out, um, you know, as long as they're not misleading people. And so anyway, so I, I don't know what people think about that. Maybe that's like too pro- you know, insurance company too accepting of a terrible world, but, but I don't, I don't know. Is that, what do people think about that? And, you know, I've been accused my Roth paper of being like a total sop for the insurance industry. And I just you don't have. understand how terrible it is. Uh, and, you know, but, you know, I don't know. I think it's hard to price things. I think when things don't work out, I think you end up spreading the pain a little bit. And if more of the pain goes to people that live longer and healthier, I don't know. Well, the alternative would presumably be that the rest of us bail, bail them out. I mean, it, there's not, there's not, yeah, there's or, claims there's, under or our you stuff, shut them so. down, you know, or you shut them down and you pay everyone the pre, you know, you, you could say, let's, let's shut it down now. Let's pay everyone the cash value, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're going to need it or not. You know what I mean? That, 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 that would be a thing, but you know, would that be better than running it out to the end so that the, you know, some people get the benefit and, you know, other people paid and didn't get the benefit, but on the other hand, they got what we really care about, which is a long, healthy life. Yeah. I don't see John, people's John. names. So I had someone that John. Uh, John Kogan, John Kogan has a hand up. Then Walter will get to you next. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Hi, Tom. Um, this is going to reveal hey, my, hi, I, I, this, I know nothing about long-term care insurance other than hearing about, you know, the big disaster that it, was and perhaps still is and so maybe this is kind of a simple question but you know i see ads for long-term insurance all the time i i get ads from yukon you know for long-term insurance and all i know is sort of the story you've covered which is it's been a complete disaster um how different is long-term care insurance now than it was when it, it exploded you know 15 20 years ago 
Or, I mean, and I, I may be my, asking my something that yeah, yeah. you've not you've not really looked at yet, but yeah, no. So the answer, I mean, the short answer is I don't can't answer that in detail. But my understanding of what it is is much more defined benefit, much more, much longer waiting period, much less uncertainty, um, and not getting traction, because what people want is something that protects them, you know, on a kind of open ended way from something that's going to be a long, a long time away. So it's you know, sort of more like an annuity product. Walter. Just thinking about talking to the regulators about these products that have a long, um, they don't pay off for a long time. And as you described in life insurance, you pay your premium, but it's, and if, if you don't die and someone else dies early, you don't get any benefit unless you've got cash value from the life insurance. But the regulators sort of understand that, that, that the public is generally okay because like fire insurance, you pay every year for your house, but your house didn't burn down. You don't say, oh, I, where's the money? I want it back. Your house didn't burn down. It's much harder for the public and even the regulators to get, get the sense around just even the long, I work with regulators on the longevity annuity, which wouldn't start paying until you're 85. And the regulators saying, we can't sell that because you don't get anything. And you only get it if you live a long time, you know, even though actuarially it works, but right. it, it's the public's view of this. And a long-term care, I think mortality is a- I just want to stop and say for a minute, I convinced my father to buy a, a deferred annuity that kicked in when he was 85 and it has recently kicked in. And explaining to him that like, hey, this is about, this is longevity insurance. This, this is like running out of your money insurance. And, and, but it, you know, it's a hard, it, the actuaries understand it, you know, but the average person would rather buy a Miata than put the money in. I mean, yeah. it's because they can use the money now and he may not get to 85. So it, there's a, right, but, right. But, but of course, but if, you get to 80, if you don't get to 85, you don't, you don't need it. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, seeing the, um, the struggle with like if long-term care in particular, something that pays in the long run, and if you don't ever need it, you don't get anything back. It's it's a, diff a different sell. I I looked at them. It's not um, long-term care, but when Executive Life of New York went under, and they had to figure out how to save the pot of money that they had because they weren't going to be able to pay everybody their full benefit because they got that company only had structured settlement annuities sitting inside it. And the real problem, they had no other risk in the company to sort of balance off. And you might say that's not fair that some other business would help pay off, say, the long term care. But when, if you have multiple lines, you get, the company can kind of cover those bets by having the other lines of insurance. Um, but but you ended up with a, a situation where finally, because they were in rehabilitation in New York and then bankruptcy in New York, cut the benefits on the structured settlement annuities coming out of executive life and smartly set up a hardship fund because the executive that had a big pension from it didn't have the hardship that someone else might have who was in an automobile accident. So they figured out a way to deal with the political pressure. Anyway, I was thinking one other thing on long-term care was that Senator Kennedy got into the, or was put in a, to the Obamacare Act. There was, there was a long-term care federal program. Uh, and then a couple of years later, they figured out they could really couldn't afford to pay for that. The class act, I haven't looked at that in a long time, but I know it was in the Obamacare uh, bill. And, well, and Walter, that's what so, mentioned in the, in the chat okay. that that uh, that the Bernie Sanders Medicare for All has a long term care yeah. aspect to it. And Walter, people are looking at the the class act that failed as a model and for a new and improved version of some federal legislation. So that's what's sort of percolating out there right now. Yeah. Thanks. Nobody bit on my controversial idea that it's. You know, maybe it's okay to take advantage of the people in the pool and convince them to keep paying so that the other people can get benefits, even though the people who are in the pool keep paying, maybe aren't going to be able to get a benefit because at some point, you know, yeah, the uh, the money runs out. Well, what I mean, I'll bite on that just a little bit in the sense that I think a lot of what seems to be going on here is that people are just, I mean, everyone said this so far, People are just not good at making the kinds of uh, evaluations of these things, which are so uncertain and have so many moving parts. I mean, you and I have written together, like you can't even figure out whether you should buy the ink toner cartridge guarantee or for your, whatever. It's like, this, is, this is 10 orders of magnitude more complicated than that. And you can fool people incredibly easily. So it seems like 
if you're going to offer people a choice, like in, in one of the memos about the ship, the ship liquidation, they offered them four different you know ways of, of getting out of this. But it, it, it seems like that could be great if they had really sophisticated financial advisors trying to help them figure it out. Otherwise, it seems to me like, what are you doing? You're just giving people choices of things they can't possibly understand. And you're just taking advantage of people's you know inability to figure this out. So it seems like there's a process problem here that you've got to overcome if you're going to make any kind of argument about, well, people will just choose or we'll, we'll let them right. sort themselves somehow. No, so I mean, I think part of what, I mean, one way to think about what, what started going on starting in 2004, and this would probably make Dan's skin crawl, is that people were misled about the likelihood of them actually getting the benefit that they thought they were going to get, but that that allowed the pool to stay together so that a lot of people did get benefits. I mean, you know, the reason they're in trouble is not only because they are piling huge reserves, it's because they've actually paid a lot of, you know, benefits to nursing homes and long-term care facilities and so forth. And, and you know, I don't, you know, I mean, the ethics of that are obviously super uh, problematic, uh, but, you know, maybe that, I mean, that, that, that's what someone might, if, you know, when they get up to St. Peter and St. Peter complains to them about how did you rip off all these people? No, I didn't rip them off. I made it possible for all these other people to get, to get money from people who turned out not to need it. Um, and, you know, isn't that what insurance is, 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 is all about? You know, I think part of what's going on with that ship rehabilitation plan is that the regulators don't want to make the choice. Mm. So that it's, but, but the, the, the pattern of choices that people make will then inform the regulator about what they need to do in the rehabilitation plan. It's almost like they don't want to throw dice and decide what to do because somehow that feels unethical. So therefore, what are they going to do? They'll essentially throw dice by asking, you know, thousands of people to make a decision they're not competent to make and then treat that collective decision as the dice throw that they'll then use to determine, you know, how much people are going to get. Hmm. And, you know, maybe it probably would have been just as good to consult, consult goat entrails or go <laughs> consult the Delphic Oracle or, you know, any of the other things that were done <laughs> in, the, in the past. But this way, the regulator feels like, hey, we use the great thing that we always do. We give people a choice. That way, it's not my responsibility. The Pennsylvania regulator in the room I will not identify is cracking up at that goat entrails <laughs> point. So uh, I think you hit home. Oh. Can I throw another question, uh, Tom's way? Yes, but that's that's the last oh. one. And then we're going to let people go. Of course. <laughs> so I just want to know whether, uh, as part of your analysis, you've taken a look at the impact, if there was any, of the various states that had partnership programs, Connecticut being one of them, where you could shelter a certain amount of your family's assets from um, Medicaid recapture um, if you had a, purchased a long-term care insurance policy. I think it was really on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis, and uh, that was. I think in the early years of long-term care insurance, that was considered one of the ways this would become a more saleable product. And, and you know what the social implications are of that, I guess, to be determined, but uh, that was a, a significant part of the marketing of long-term care insurance in Connecticut, at least. So I remember sitting through such a presentation in the faculty, in what is now the faculty, I think it was the faculty presentation room uh, at, UConn Law School, where someone was explaining that to me, and I'd say my reaction to that is 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 the penalty. My penalty for doing this talk is that Bob Yass has given me two very <laughs> deep, very twisty trails that I now have to track down, but I, for which I'm grateful. But but it's going to be a lot of work figuring it figure All out. All right, so we'll talk. Yeah, and if the and if the uh, Pennsylvania regulator in the room wants to talk to me 100% off the record. I would be super delighted. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty friendly with Joel Ario, and I hadn't realized how deeply involved he was in this. So I think I might have to have an off the record conversation with him too. So, all right. Well, it's five o'clock, and since you can just disappear electronically, I'm not going to excuse everybody, but uh, you're now officially excused. And Tom, if you're willing to stick around to keep going, oh, I'll stick around. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, so I think this recording is. Uh, I can turn off the recording and, uh,